Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Rumberg. I'm a managing partner with MetricNet, and I will be your host for today's webcast on desktop support best practices. I want to welcome all of you and thank you for participating in this webcast today. Before we get started, I have just a few administrative announcements to make. During the presentation, all of you will be in listen-only mode. However, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can type them in the dialog box that appears in the lower right corner of your screen, and I will pause once during the presentation to answer questions. Additionally, I will remain on the webcast at the conclusion of the presentation to answer any final questions that you might have or that I did not get to during the first Q&A break. The presentation usually goes about an hour and a half, so for those of you who have other commitments later in the day, I should be wrapped up by about 3.30 Eastern Time. Finally, just a quick word about MetricNet before we get started. I see that quite a few of our existing clients have joined us on the webcast today. But for those of you who have not worked with MetricNet before, let me give you just a brief introduction. MetricNet's core business is benchmarking. We perform benchmarks for a variety of industries and functional areas and complete more than 300 benchmarks per year. My role in the company is to manage the desktop support, service desk, and call center benchmarks at MetricNet. The work we do for desktop support groups worldwide spans the gambit from benchmarking and best practice assessments to consolidation studies and outsourcing analyses. Typically, the support organizations that we work with are looking to optimize their performance. We help them achieve those objectives through benchmarking. One final note, and this is particularly important for those who wish to receive a copy of the presentation, when you exit the webcast, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. Please be aware that only those who complete the survey will receive a copy of the presentation. This survey provides us with valuable feedback on the webcast. It's only two questions long, and it takes less than 10 seconds to complete. So if you'd do us a favor and answer that survey at the end of the webcast, I'd be very grateful, and in return for that courtesy, I will send you a copy of today's presentation. OK, let's go ahead and get started. If you have any difficulties at all during today's webcast, you can reach Met MetricNet in one of two ways. You can email us at info at metricnet.com, or you can call us in the United States at 202-321-5760. We have people standing by monitoring both that phone line as well as that email box. So if you have any difficulties with the audio or video portion of today's webcast, you can contact us that way, and we'll try and get you back up and, and uh, into the webcast again. Now, we've got four items on today's agenda. We'll cover the first three of those items, starting with a historical perspective. What I want to do is get everybody level set in terms of how this industry is evolving and why support is becoming a much more strategic activity than it has been historically. So we'll spend a few minutes just kind of setting the table for the best practices discussion to come. But very quickly, I'm going to get into the sec second section of our presentation, a model for desktop support best practices, which addresses support strategy, performance measurement, human resource management, and what we call marketing, which is really about managing stakeholder expectations. Finally, I'm going to close with a brief summary and some tips on how you can immediately put to use some of the insights that you gain from today's best practices presentation. So let's get started with our historical perspective. It's important to recognize that everything you see and hear today is empirical in nature. And what I mean by that is that it is based upon what we have seen in 23 years of benchmarking desktop support organizations. MetricNet has created the most comprehensive database of desktop support process and performance indicators in the, in the industry. It includes more than 900 desktop support benchmarks, more than 30 KPIs, key performance indicators, and we've also identified nearly 60 best practices that address everything from strategy and human resources to performance measurement and technology. So what you're seeing here today is not a theoretical exercise. There's nothing academic about it. It is pure empirical observation. It is based upon what we have seen in 23 years of doing this type of benchmarking, what works, what doesn't work, what do those top performing desktop support organizations have in common with each other. Now it's instructive to look at how 
some of the key performance indicators have evolved since we began benchmarking in 1988. If we look at a number of key performance indicators, an interesting story emerges when we look at the performance metric back in 1988 and look at the performance metric last year. For example, if you look at the number of desktop support tickets per seat within an organization, back in 1988 there was about a half a ticket per seat per month. Last year that number had grown to about 0.8 tickets per seat per month. And that's a reflection of the growing complexity of the typical end user's environment. Back in 1988, the end user probably had a desktop and nothing more. Last year, the average end user, the average knowledge worker, had more than three devices. Could be a printer, a laptop computer, a desktop computer, a smartphone, a tablet. There's a variety of devices now being supported, and those drive a higher support workload. The cost per ticket, that is the fully loaded cost of support divided by the ticket volume at desktop support. Back in 1988, that number was $29. Last year, the number had grown to $62. Here's one of the primary reasons why. The work time per incident was about 17 and a half minutes in 1988. Last year, it was more than 32 minutes. And that, again, is a reflection of the more complex environment that is now being supported. And users have more devices. There are more applications. There are simply more things that need support and more things that can go wrong and require desktop support. Now here's where the data starts to get really interesting. The incidents resolved on first contact back in 1988, about 74% of them were resolved on first contact. Last year, that number had dropped to 68%. Now that's interesting. And to interpret that, to understand why incident first contact resolution would actually decline, the next metric, the percent of tickets resolved by desktop support that are level one capable. No, that sounds like a lot, but essentially what it means is the percentage of tickets resolved by desktop support that could and should have been resolved by the service desk at level one. That number's dropped fairly dramatically. It was 54% in 1988. Last year it was 22%. That's a good thing. Because any time you have desktop support resolving a ticket that could and should have been resolved at level one, that re represents a defect. And those defects cost a lot of money. Because resolution at desktop support is significantly more costly than resolution at the level one service desk. So what has happened from 1988 to last year is that fewer tickets are being resolved at desktop support that could have and should have been resolved at level one. You see, back in 1988, a lot of service desks were really just log and dispatch or bag and tag. They were message taking services. They would resolve the easy problems, like password resets, printer recycles, things like that. And everything else got pushed out to another level of support, including a significant number of tickets that got pushed to desktop support that could have been resolved at level one. By last year, that was not the case so much anymore. And the result is that we see fewer tickets being resolved by desktop support that could have and should have been resolved at level one. 22% is still too high a number, but it's a whole lot better than the 54% in 1988. Now the reason the first contact incident resolution rate has gone down is because there are fewer of these level one tickets being pushed to desktop support and as a result the ticket mix that desktop support receives is significantly more complex than it was 25 years ago which is why the handle times have gone up and as a result the incident first contact resolution rate has dropped a bit from 74 percent to 68 percent but this is not a bad thing it's a reflection of the positive trend in the reduction of tickets being resolved by desktop support that could have and should have been resolved at the level one service desk. If we look at technician salaries back in 1988, and these are current dollars. They've been adjusted for inflation. They represent last year's dollars. In 1988, a technician, a starting technician in desktop support was paid about $37,000. Last year, the number was more than $43,600. Now you can look at this and say, well, what's happened? Has IT become more benevolent? Do they just want to pay desktop technicians more than they have historically? The short answer is no, that's not what's going on at all. What's going on here is the recognition of the fact that when you're willing to pay a little bit more for a technician, you get a more qualified, more experienced, better educated technician, and they are able to drive both higher first contact resolution rates and higher levels of customer satisfaction. 
Now, there's a wage rate paradox, interestingly enough, where to a certain extent, as starting salaries increase, cost per ticket actually goes down. It goes down from this number to a certain extent. You can't increase that trend indefinitely and expect to see a reduction in the cost per ticket. But the reason is that, again, with a higher starting salary, you get a more experienced, better educated, more qualified technician or agent. And they, in turn, drive higher first contact resolution rates, lower handle times, higher customer satisfaction, and lower cost per ticket. Now, if we look at the average cost of supporting a seat or a person back in 1988, it was about $184 per year. Last year, that number had grown to almost $600. And the reason is that we've got more tickets being generated per seat, and the cost per ticket is greater than it was back in 1988. So we've seen about a threefold increase in the cost of desktop support per seat per year as a result of these trends. But perhaps the most important trend here is this one. This is a recognition of the fact that level one resolution rate is a good thing. Level one resolution is good, or get it done at level one, as they say in the industry, because that is the lowest cost resolution. Only tickets that have to be resolved at the desktop should be resolved at the desktop. So the decrease in this metric, percent resolved, level one capable, is a very, very positive trend. It reflects a maturing industry that recognizes the importance of minimizing total cost of ownership for desktop support. Now, we make a distinction between incidents and service requests. If you add the two together, add up all your incidents and service requests, you get your total volume of tickets. So a ticket can be either an incident or a service request. And I want to clarify this right up front because I'm going to be using this terminology throughout the presentation. I realize your vernacular may be a bit different, but let me explain ours. An incident is typically unplanned work. This could include a hardware break fix, a device failure, a connectivity failure, where service requests oftentimes are generally planned work, things like move ads and changes, hardware and software upgrades, a device refresh, a device setup. But once again, if you add together all your incidents and service requests, you come up with your total ticket volume. So this is the vernacular we're going to be using in today's best practices presentation. Now, I use the terminology world-class or best-in-class somewhat interchangeably, but I think it's important to define what I mean by that. There's four components in our definition. The first element is that you consistently exceed customer expectations. This results in high levels of customer satisfaction, and we generally define the threshold as being 93% or greater. That's the industry average. Mean time to resolve needs to be below industry average. Now, the industry average MTTR for incidents is about 0.7 working days. That would be about five hours, five working hours, that is. And the MTTR mean time to resolve for service requests is just under four days. So if your customer satisfaction is higher than average and your mean time to resolve is below average, that's one element of our best practices or world-class definition. The second element is cost. Your cost per ticket, per incident, per service request needs to be below average. And we like to see that you have a small number for percent resolved level one capable. That means that you're helping to minimize total cost of ownership to the point where, in some cases, when you get a ticket that you know can be resolved at level one, you push it back to level one. There's nothing wrong with that unless you're deliberately accepting those tickets because level one happens to be overwhelmed. There's a spike in tickets or whatever the case might be. There are occasionally legitimate reasons to be resolving tickets at desktop support that could and should be resolved at level one, but those instances should be few and far between. The third element of our definition is this. You're following industry best practices. Now, the good news is that best practices are pretty well defined and documented at this point, and in fact, what you're seeing today is an abbreviated version of a full two-day workshop that MetricNet delivers on desktop support best practices. So we won't be able to elaborate on every single industry best practices at best practice, but what you are seeing today is a, a fairly condensed version of what the industry's top performing desktop support organizations do day in and day out. Finally, and most subjectively, every transaction adds value. What this means is that the customer has a positive experience, and that in turn drives a positive view, not just for support, but for IT overall. Now, we can also define what it means to be world-class graphically. If we look at the cost per ticket on the x-axis and customer satisfaction on the y-axis, and we take data from our database and we plot cost versus quality, we get a locus of points represented by these 
blue dots here, they show that there clearly is some relationship between cost and quality. Now, not only that, it is a cause-effect relationship. For some organizations, the drive for quality will drive costs higher. For other organizations, the need to drive costs out of the system will, in some cases, impact quality. But here's the real point of this slide. What I want to do is use this to explain what it means to be world class, because we get asked almost every day by our clients all over the world, what does a world class desktop support organization look like? What is their cost per ticket? What is their customer satisfaction? What's the incident first contact resolution rate? What is the mean time to resolve? And the short answer is, I can't give you an absolute definition of what it means to be world class until you tell me what your budget constraints are. Because like it or not, every support organization everywhere is constrained to a certain extent by budget. They're constrained with dollars. In some cases, they're constrained by lack of headcount. In some cases, they're constrained by technology. There are a whole lot of constraints that all of you operate under. Now, those that operate under fewer constraints are going to have a higher cost per ticket. Those who have severe, particularly cost constraints on them, are going to have a lower cost per ticket. So you have to ask yourself, if you are resource constrained, what is the best you can do given the resources you have? And if you're doing the absolute best that you can with the limited resources you have, you're going to end up on this upper curve. We call it the best in class performance curve. So you can be a very high cost per ticket organization and be world class. Your mean time to resolve might be an hour on incidents and four hours on service requests, for example. Your customer satisfaction might be 99.5% but your cost per ticket might be $400. That's not unusual. And for a world-class desktop support organization that is willing to pay that price, they can expect to deliver that kind of performance. By contrast, for an organization that is resource constrained and is only spending $25 or $30 per ticket, they might be doing pretty well to get 70% customer satisfaction, to have a mean time to resolve of a full day on an incident and a full week on a service request. Their cost per ticket might be significantly lower than those that are way out here, but it is still possible to be world class. The question is, are you using your limited resources in the best possible way that you can? If you are, you will end up on this optimized curve here that brackets the data points that I've shown. And if you end up on that optimized curve, what it says is that you are achieving the best possible performance with the limited resources that you have. So there truly is a cause and effect relationship between cost and quality. Sometimes it is driven by the need to drive to push cost out of the system. Other times it is driven by the need to deliver a higher quality experience. But regardless of whether or not you're a cost-driven organization or a quality-driven organization, being world class is the same regardless of what type of an organization you are. The simple question is this. With the resources you have, are you achieving the best possible result? If you're below this green curve, if you're down here on this average performance curve, the short answer is no, you're not doing that. And what you need to do is push cost out of the system and drive quality into the system. They say there's no free lunch, but if you're not yet optimized, there are opportunities to reduce cost and improve the quality of service simultaneous, simultaneously. Now with that, I'm going to open up our first polling question of the day. And as you can imagine, the polling question is about world-class performance. And here's the question. Given the definition I've just given you of world-class performance, do you consider your desktop support to be world-class? Do you have cost below the industry average level? Do you have customer satisfaction above industry average levels? Are you following industry best practices? And are you adding value on every transaction? OK, about 60% of you have weighed in on that. We like to try and get 80-plus uh, percent voting in our polls. So if you possibly can, uh, please vote. I want to welcome all of you uh, while you're voting on this. Um, we've got a great crowd today uh, from more than 30 countries. I'll just shout out uh, to a few of you. Brian Miller, thanks for coming. Joe Hackney, appreciate you coming. Michael Webb, just calling out names randomly here. Want to thank you for uh, joining us today. Paul Farrell, thanks for coming. Rita Pearson, thanks for coming. OK, we've got almost 90% participation in our poll right now. So I'm going to go ahead and close that and share the results with you. OK, here are the results. 24% of you, based upon the definition I've just given, believe that you are a world-class 
desktop support function. 66% say, no, we're not there yet. And then another 10% of you answered, not applicable. That's because you're probably not associated with a desktop support group. You may be a consulting organization or you may work in the service desk. Could be a variety of reasons why you voted not applicable. But this is a fairly common result. Generally, about two-thirds of the participants in our webcast indicate that they don't yet believe that they're there in terms of world-class performance, whereas about a fourth, 20 to 25 percent, generally say, yeah, we, we think we're there. So for those that voted yes, let me congratulate you. It's not an easy thing to achieve world-class performance. For those that are not quite there yet, let me offer some words of encouragement, which are these. The path to world-class performance is pretty straightforward now. And once again, what I'm presenting here over the next hour or so is a condensed version of a full two-day conference that MetricNet delivers on industry best practices in desktop support. Generally, if you follow what you see here today, and it's pretty straightforward stuff, you can get there. There aren't a lot of obstacles or hurdles in the way. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It shouldn't take a lot of time to go from where you are to what is considered to be a world-class level of performance. So for those that don't yet believe that you're there, let me offer those words of encouragement and ask you to accept the challenge to start pushing your organization towards world-class performance. Hopefully by the end of today's webcast, you'll have a clear idea of what that means and you'll understand the path that you need to take in order to get your desktop support function to a world-class level of performance. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll down and we're going to get right into our model now for industry best practices. This model addresses support strategy, performance measurement, human resource management, and marketing. And we're going to start with strategy. And I'm going to start by identifying three sources of leverage that the top performing world-class desktop support organizations exploit and use to their advantage. The first one is this. They understand total cost of ownership when it comes to support, and they take steps to minimize TCO. I've already alluded to some of the things that can be done. For example, pushing a ticket back to level one if you think it can be resolved at level one. Secondly, improving end user productivity. This is one of the primary sources of economic value created by a good support organization, is that they make end users more productive. You don't have to take my word for it. I'm going to show you some evidence and some data that backs that up. And the third thing is that a top performing support organization, desktop support as well as a service desk, can drive a positive view not just of support, but of all of information technology. These are three critically important sources of leverage that most support organizations, not only do they not take advantage of them, but most support organizations don't even know about these. Let me start with total cost of ownership. Last year in North America, the average fully loaded cost to resolve a ticket at the service desk was about $22. At desktop support, it was $62. Now this is additive. This is $62 on top of the $22. So if a ticket comes in, let's say you're a SPOC, single point of contact support organization, a ticket comes in through the service desk and then gets dispatched to desktop support, what you've got is $62 on average in North America on top of the initial $22. So these are additive. Now if you push it out to another IT group, and I realize my terminology may be different than yours, we call it level three, but let's say an application group, a networking group, a NOC, et cetera, the cost on average for one of those IT professionals who resolve a ticket is about $85. You push it to field support. You've got to jump in a car or a truck and drive someplace to fix the problem. On average, $200 per ticket. And when you get the vendor involved, on average, it's almost $500 per ticket. So when they say get it done at level one, that's not just a, a nice catchphrase. It has real economic value. And any time you push a ticket from level one to the desktop or level three or field support or vendor that could have and should have been resolved at level one, that is a defect and you are incurring additional costs, significant additional costs, by doing so. Now, how do you avoid that? Well, the primary remedy is this. You need to run a SPOC, a single point of contact support organization. Diagrammatically, this is what it looks like. You've got the service desk here, the user community out here. They could be remote. They could be local. And you've got other support levels. We call it N-level support, everything from desktop support to vendor support, everything in between. Now, the service desk is not expected to resolve everything that comes in, but they do need to play traffic cop. Key SPOC principles are this. You've got to take an end-to-end -end view of user support. You've got to give the users a single point of contact. 
for every IT-related incident and question. The service desk is, in fact, a SPOC, a single point of contact source of support. The service desk is responsible for triaging tickets, that is, assigning them either to themselves or to other support organizations, resolution if possible, effective and efficient handoffs to what we call end-level support, any other support level, resolution, coordination, and facilitation, and ticket closure. Now, for some organizations, it makes sense to have other levels of support close the ticket. You might have an apps group or a data center or a not close the ticket. You might have field services or desktop support close the ticket. But there needs to be a closed loop system whereby the service desk checks to ensure that tickets are being closed within the service level agreements that you have with your customers and within the operating level agreements, assuming that you have those, between level one support and the other levels of support. Now, key to making SPOC work is this. You probably heard of these drive-bys, fly-bys, snags. This is when a desktop support technician is walking past, and they get grabbed by somebody who says, hey, can you help me out here? I'm trying to change the resolution on my screen. Or I'm trying to archive these old Outlook items. Or I'm trying to turn rows into columns in Excel. Can you help me do that? The short answer by the desktop support technician should be, we're a SPOC. You've got to call the level one service desk. If they can't resolve it, they will dispatch it to me or some other desktop support technician. That is the proper way to manage a SPOC. And if you haven't run a SPOC organization historically, and your end users are used to grabbing the nearest desktop support technician, in other words, if drive-bys and flybys and snags are common, yes, it's going to be a bit of a shock to the system when you start following a SPOC model. And you will see a short-term depression in customer satisfaction. But for the greater good of the organization, to help minimize these tickets that are resolved by desktop support that could and should have been resolved at level one, SPOC is the way to go, and you've got to stick to the SPOC model pretty strictly. If you don't enforce it, if you allow these drive-bys, these fly-bys, these snags, some people call it bypass because you're bypassing the entry point to the SPOC support model, then it's going to be very, very difficult to minimize TCO for support, total cost of ownership. What is it worth to an organization? Well, this data, based on a survey done by MetricNet, the blue diamonds here represent the number of tickets resolved by desktop support that could and should have been resolved at level one in a SPOC organization. The fuchsia, hot pink I guess would be the color here, the fuchsia squares represent the percentage of tickets resolved by desktop support that is not following a SPOC single point of contact support model. You can see that on average, the SPOC support organizations, about 15.3% of the tickets resolved at desktop support could and should have been resolved at level one. By contrast, for those that are not following a single point of contact support model, almost 23% of the tickets they resolve could and should have been resolved at level one. That's an eight percentage point difference. Even 15.3% of the tickets being resolved at desktop support that could and should have been resolved at level one, that's too much. But it's way too much when you're at 23%. So what is the economic value of SPOC? This is one way of looking at it, is that you can help to minimize these escalation or these dispatch defects and get things resolved at level one rather than pushing them to desktop support or some other level of support. Now, the second source of value, remember we're talking about three sources of leverage here. We talked about total cost of ownership. SPOC is a way to minimize that, TCO. Secondly, we want to talk about end user productivity. Now, the chart on page 18 seems a little bit complicated, so let me explain it here for a couple of minutes. What we did is we looked at organizations worldwide, a total of 60 of them. We looked at both their service desk and their desktop support functions. And we looked at three metrics. We looked at customer satisfaction, first contact res rate at level one, mean time to resolve in hours, and we looked at the same metrics for desktop support. Then we organized these support organizations into quartiles based upon how they performed according to those metrics. Now here's the interesting conclusion. The average knowledge worker in North America last year lost about 33 hours of productive time due to various IT outages, software break fix, hardware break fix, connectivity failure, network outages, things like that. 33 hours. Now, the majority of North America's workforce is, in fact, made up of knowledge workers. And they almost always have more than one device. I mentioned them earlier. You might have a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, tablet computer, 
There's a whole lot of stuff going on in the environment. And when those devices don't work the way they're supposed to, you might have a workaround, but it's still going to slow you down. In a worst case scenario, you can't do your job at all. So it's very quickly, it's very important to get those end users up and running again as quickly as possible. So what we measured was the amount of productive time lost by these organizations if their support fell in the top quartile, the second quartile, the third, and the fourth quartile. So let me explain this. Top quartile performers were the best performing support organizations. Second quartile performers were, well, second quartile, the second, fourth of you know, this group of 60. Third quartile, fourth quartile are the worst performers. If you work in a company whose support is in the top quartile, the average knowledge worker lost about 17 hours of productive time last year. Okay, that's not insignificant, but it's a whole lot less than the industry average, which was 33 hours. If you worked in an organization that had a second quartile performing support organization, you lost about 26 productive hours last year. If you were in a third quartile performing organization, you lost about 37 hours of productive time. And if you were in an organization that had a bottom quartile support organization, you lost about 47 hours of productive time. Now look at the difference between the top quartile and the bottom quartile. If I'm a knowledge worker in a bottom quartile support organization, I'm going to lose about 47 productive hours a year. That's more than a full week. But if I work in a top performing support organization, I only lose about 17 hours. The difference between the two is about 30 hours per year per knowledge worker. Multiply that by hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of employees within an organization, and you can see that there's real value, real economic value delivered by top performing support organizations. They return productive hours to the end users within the enterprise. That can be quantified. That's worth real money to the enterprise. The difference between quartile one, quartile four, roughly 30 productive hours per year, that's almost a full week of productivity that you're returning to every end user within the organization. That is significant. This is a critical source of value, and it's important for every support organization, whether you're in the service desk or desktop support, to understand this. Because adding economic value, creating an economic contribution through minimizing total cost of ownership, and by being a top performing support organization, adds real value to an organization. The third source of leverage that is oftentimes unrecognized and there go, thereby goes unexploited is this. The vast majority of end users decide what they think about IT based upon their interactions with support. This involved more than a thousand organizations worldwide. They were all large cap companies, more than a billion dollars in annual sales. We gave them a multiple choice survey. We told them they could pick their top three answers, which is why when you add these up, it adds to more than 100%. But the question was around how do you determine whether or not IT is performing their job well? What drives your view of IT, good, bad, or indifferent? 84% cited the service desk as a very important factor in their overall satisfaction with corporate IT. 47%, these numbers here, 47% said that desktop support was a very important factor in their overall satisfaction with corporate IT. Think about this. The average IT organization spends less than 5% of their budget on support. Yet the vast majority of end user opinion is the result of interactions they have with support. And that makes sense because your average end user doesn't hang out in the data center or the NOC. They don't hang out with the application developers. But they do interact periodically with the service desk. And they do interact periodically with desktop support. These support organizations are the window into IT for the end user. And if they have a good experience, they're going to think great things about IT. If they have a bad experience, just the opposite will be the case. So if I'm a senior manager within an organization, or a CTO or a CIO, and I see this, my marching orders are clear. I'm going to invest whatever it takes in dollars, technology, headcount, and in my personal time and attention to make sure that our service desk and our desktop support functions are in fact top quartile and that every customer that comes away from a transaction with the service desk or desktop support is not just satisfied, but they're very satisfied because that will translate into a high level of customer satisfaction for all of IT. And that makes me look good as a CIO or a CTO. 
So the key to driving customer satisfaction for all of IT is to have a strong support function. Have world-class service at the desktop, desktop support. Have world-class support at level one at the service desk. That will drive a positive view of all of IT. That reflects positively on IT leadership and management. These are the three critical sources of leverage that a strategic support organization will exploit and use to their advantage. Let's move on now. We're going to talk about metrics. And I'm going to start by showing you a long list of metrics here on page 21, broken down into seven key groups. We've got cost metrics, quality metrics, productivity, service level, technician metrics, workload metrics, and then what we call ticket handling metrics. This is a long list, but it doesn't even scratch the surface on all the metrics that I've seen out there. There are literally hundreds of key performance indicators that are used by desktop support organizations worldwide. Let me give you a slightly different way of thinking about these KPIs. We have what are called macro measures. Cost and quality are examples. Your cost per ticket, your customer satisfaction, those are examples of macro measures. They tell the story of your performance. And they are good for communicating the performance of desktop support. But you can't control them directly. If, if I am doing a benchmark and I find that a desktop support group has high cost and low customer satisfaction, I can't just go out there and tweak this number or tweak that number. But what I can do is impact the underlying drivers of the cost and quality metrics, macro measures. So the drivers are where you've got real leverage. These are your productivity metrics, your service level metrics, your technician and ticket handling metrics. These are what drive your macro measures. You can control these metrics directly. And it's through these metrics that you can influence the macro measures and improve your performance. Finally, we have a category of metrics called causal metrics or workload metrics. The workload metrics are driven by causal factors. The causal factors will define the volume and mix of work performed by desktop support. You don't have much control over this. It is what it is. You know, the environment hands you what the environment hands you, and you've got to deal with it. They are a function of the environment that you work in. Let me elaborate on this because there's an important point I want to make. The causal factors include things like the device count, how many devices, and what's the mix of devices. Laptops require more care and feeding than desktops do. The number of mobile devices, the average age of devices, how standardized is your environment, what's the user population density. If you're in a high rise, your travel time to and from each ticket is pretty short. But if you're in a campus or a field environment, your travel time to and from a ticket might be an hour or more. That drives up the cost per ticket. The work location of the user, are they in an office? Are they working from home? Are they in the field? That will drive your workload and a number of other factors. Here's the reason I'm emphasizing this. First of all, I already made this point. The environment is what the environment is. You can't really influence it that much at least in the short term. The volume of tickets you get can't really be controlled. It is, it is based on or driven by all these external factors. The second point, and the one that's a little more subtle, is this. We get asked all the time, gee, we've got 1,000 end users. How many desktop support techs do we need? The answer is, I, I don't know. I have no idea. It doesn't matter how many users you've got. What matters is how much support they need how many tickets they generate, the device count and mix, the mix of desktop and laptop, the number of mobile devices, the average age, that's what it depends on. And we have seen organizations that have as many as 20 desktop support technicians for every 1,000 users. And we've seen organizations that have as few as one desktop support technician for every 1,000 users. And they were both efficient. The fact is they don't have control over the mix of work that they get. And so this idea that there is a common ratio, well, we need five desktop techs for every 1,000 end users or 10 desktop techs for every, it's bogus. Stay away from those ratios. They will lead you astray. What matters is the, is the volume of work generated by the end user population, and that in turn is driven by these causal factors. So the environment is what the environment is. If you've got 1,000 end users, you might need 20 desktop techs. You might need one desktop tech. It all depends upon all of these causal factors. Now, since we're talking about metrics, we've all heard this expression. If you're not measuring it, you're not managing it. And you've heard probably variations on this phrase, what gets measured gets treasured, and various variations on that. 
But there is a whole lot more to the story, and that is the following. Most organizations spend too much time gathering data and not enough time acting on that data. This is the historical approach that most support organizations take. The problem is the value increases as you go up the pyramid. Action is far more valuable than the measurement by itself. Measurement by itself doesn't do much for you. It's interesting. It's nice to know what your mean time to resolve is, what your cost per ticket is, what your customer satisfaction is. But unless it informs intelligent management actions and decisions, it's useless. So what we've seen emerge in the last three to five years is a very different approach to key performance indicators, what we call the holistic approach. It de-emphasizes measurement, and it emphasizes the actions that you take based on those measures. So in this paradigm, there's just a handful of measures that are tracked. They don't track this big, ugly list of metrics. There's a handful, and I'll share those with you momentarily. They spend a fair amount of time evaluating that data. And then they spend even more time developing action plans, a prescription based on that data. And then where the rubber really meets the road is action, management decisions, management action based upon and informed by those measurements. This holistic approach that we have seen emerge in the industry in the last three to five years is far more effective than the historical approach that we have seen. And so what we're going to concentrate on in this section of our best practices model is how this holistic approach manifests itself in those organizations that do a great job of measuring and managing their performance. So let's take this long list, throw it away, and say, here are the metrics that really matter. We don't want to throw them all away. There are a few in here that are good. And these are the metrics that really matter. The first two are what are called the foundation metrics, cost per ticket and customer satisfaction. They're called the foundation metrics because everything you do in your desktop support organization boils down to one of two things. You're either trying to contain cost or you're trying to drive a higher quality customer experience. That's it. Nothing else matters. And when you view your, your support organization through that lens of cost and quality, your job is greatly simplified. You may be faced with 100 decisions a day, but subject them to this simple test. If I make this decision one way or another, does it help to contain or reduce my cost? Does it help to improve the quality of the customer experience over time? If the answer is yes, then it's probably worth doing. If the answer is no, then it is not worth doing. Simple as that. So these are the foundation metrics, the two most important metrics in the organization, your cost per ticket and your customer satisfaction. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these are what are called macro measures. They tell an interesting story, but you can't impact them directly. What you can impact are the underlying drivers of those two metrics, which are technician satisfaction, that drives your cost per ticket, and your incident first contact resolution rate, which drives your customer satisfaction, and your mean time to resolve for service requests, which also drives customer satisfaction. We also include on our short list the TCO metric. It's really a proxy for total cost of ownership, and that is this metric I've mentioned several times now, the percent of tickets resolved by the desktop that could and should have been resolved at level one. Technician satisfaction is an important metric because it has a secondary impact on just about every other key performance indicator in desktop support. And finally, because you do have so many metrics, and they're oftentimes moving in different directions, it's important to have a single all-inclusive measure of the performance for desktop support. That is the balance scorecard. And I'm going to show you right now how we build a balance scorecard. And then the remainder of these metrics, I'm going to explain using a benchmarking case study. So let's look at the balance scorecard. There's eight metrics in this sample scorecard. Your scorecard might have four, it might have 10. Pick the metrics that you believe to be the most important. The eight that we've included here are the ones that we think are most important. We then weight them according to their relative importance. This is a judgment call. I'll be the first to admit that. But this represents our judgment in, in terms of which metrics are more important. Customer satisfaction, it's a big one. It gets 25% of the weight. Then what we have is for a representative benchmarking peer group, we have some performance ranges. What is the worst case scenario? What is the best case scenario on each one of these metrics? You then put your own performance in the third column from the right, and this is sample data, and you can calculate a metric score for each one of the eight KPIs on the scorecard using this simple formula. It's an interpolation formula. What's the worst case in the, your peer group, benchmarking peer group, minus your actual performance, that's your numerator, you divide that by the range, worst case minus best case. Okay? Now, for 
if you're performing well, according to the metric, you're going to have a high score, close to 100%. This score will range between 0 and 100%. A high score means that you're closer to the best end of the spectrum. A low score, such as we have here on technician utilization, means that you are much closer to the weaker end or the worst performing end of the spectrum. The next thing you're going to do is multiply your metric score by your metric weighting to come up with a balanced score for each of the metrics in your scorecard. And when you add these up, you get a single score. Okay, you look at this and you say, well, 67.1%, that doesn't sound all that great. But the reality is, when we run hundreds of organizations worldwide through this algorithm, top quartile performers are generally 62% and above. Second quartile performers are between 50 and 62%. Third quartile performers are between 38 and 50%. And anything below 38% is usually a fourth quartile performer. Moreover, it's a nice bell-shaped curve. We've got a nice normal distribution with tails running off to the right above 60%, tails running off to the left uh, below uh, 30%. The value of this is that it creates this single measure that rolls together and aggregates cost metrics, quality metrics, productivity metrics, ticket handling metrics, service level metrics, and technician metrics, and it gives you a single overall measure that you can use to compare to other desktop support organizations, which is what I'm showing here on page 29, roughly 100 desktop support organizations, the ca score calculated on the prior page, 67.1%, compare that to 100 other desktop support organizations, the low score was 16%, way over here on the lower right, high score 86.2%, way over here on the left, average score 51.9%, that's this dashed line. The value of this is that it gives you that overall measure of how you compare to other desktop support groups, but it also enables you to track and trend your performance over time, as shown here. The blue bars represent the monthly score in the balanced scorecard. The red background or the purple background represents the trailing 12-month average. That's the real value of the balanced scorecard. You take a whole dis a disparate set of metrics with different units, different values, you boil it all down to a single metric that can be compared from one desktop support organization to another and that can be used to track and trend your performance over time. We're going to switch gears a little bit now and use a benchmarking case study to discuss the remainder of our key performance indicators. So it only makes sense to define benchmarking right up front. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It involves comparing the performance of your desktop support group to that of a comparable peer group, comparable in terms of scope and scale and complexity and geography. Those are the four things that you've got to get right. This is the most important piece in benchmarking. If you're going to do it right, you have to have a peer group that is comparable to you, again, in the four dimensions of scope and scale and complexity and geography. You run the comparisons on things like mean time to resolve, customer satisfaction, cost per ticket, cost per incident, cost per service request. And when you find a negative performance gap, you simply ask yourself, how is it that these other companies or this other company is able to achieve a better level of performance? If you understand what they're doing, you can adopt and adapt and achieve the same level of performance within your own organization. You know, given enough time, any desktop support group can become world class. The question is, how long is it going to take you? Is it going to take you years? Or are you going to build upon the proven best practices of the industry's superior performers and improve your performance not at an evolutionary pace through trial and error, through blood, sweat, and tears, but at a revolutionary pace by building upon the proven best practices of the industry's superior performers. That's the real value of benchmarking. If you'd like to read more about the methodology, you can go to our website and download a white paper that we've got that talks about benchmarking the IT support function. Now, we've got a couple of polling questions. I'm going to open those up, and then we're going to get right into our case study. Polling question, first polling question, is this. Have you benchmarked your desktop support function? within the past 12 months? Have you benchmarked your desktop support function within the last 12 months? OK, we're getting good participation. We're up over 50% already. I'd like to thank those of you in uh, India, the Philippines, China, Australia, Japan, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and other Pacific Rim countries for dialing in today. I know it's in the middle of the night your time. They're very early in the morning or very late at night, and I really appreciate you participating in our webcast. OK, give you a few more seconds here to weigh in on this. Have you benchmarked desktop support within the past 12 months? We're almost to 90%. Please weigh in if you'd like to. OK, with that, I'm going to go ahead and 
um, close the poll and share the results with you. Okay, 18% have not or have benchmarked within the past 12 months. 70% have not benchmarked within the past 12 months, and 11% are not applicable. Interestingly enough, this pretty closely reflects the first poll, which was, do you consider yourself to be world class? You may recall that about 25% said yes, 66% uh, said no. Isn't it interesting that this poll kind of mirrors and reflects that? And that is not a coincidence. Not a coincidence because we have found that there is almost a one-to-one -one relationship between desktop support organizations that benchmark and those that are world class. Now, some are world class because they benchmark. Some benchmark because they're world class. It doesn't matter you know, if it's the tail wagging the dog or the dog wagging the tail. The fact is there is a one-to-one -one correlation almost between benchmarking and world class performance. Those who do it are world class. So for those that aren't yet benchmarking or haven't benchmarked within the last 12 months, let me encourage you to think about doing that. It doesn't take a lot of time. doesn't cost a lot of money. But the benefits of benchmarking are huge. I've just outlined them. It's the ability to build upon the industry's proven best practices, avoid all the trial and error associated with incremental improvement, and improve your performance at a revolutionary pace. Bypass all the trial and error, all the blood, sweat, and tears associated with incremental improvement, and achieve world-class performance in the most efficient possible way. Get there quickly. Get there without spending a lot of money. Let me go ahead and open up the final poll of the day, and it also has to do with benchmarking. And the poll question is this. Do you plan to benchmark your desktop support function in the future? There are five possible choices here. Within the next 90 days, meaning before the end of the year, if that's the case, you need to move fairly quickly. Uh, yes, within the next six months. Yes, within the next year. No plans to benchmark at this time. And then, you know, not applicable. So uh, we're getting good participation. We're up to almost 70%. So for those of you that would, that would like to weigh in on this poll, please do so. It's the last poll of the day. Do you plan to benchmark your desktop support function in the future? Okay, we're past 80%. If you'd like to weigh in on this, please do so. If you'd like to get as much participation as we can, get some statistical significance. We've already got several hundred people having voted here. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and then share the results with you. Here it is. Okay. 16% are planning to benchmark desktop support within the next 90 days. Another 16% within the next six months. 26%, roughly a fourth of you, planning to benchmark within the next year. And then 27% say no plans to benchmark at this time. Now, those 27% who are not planning to benchmark at this time, I'm guessing that there's a fair amount of overlap between the 27% who have no plans to benchmark at this time and the 18% on the poll that we just did that said that they have uh, benchmarked uh, within the past year. So I'm, I'm guessing that there's a fair amount of overlap between the group that's not planning to benchmark and those that have benchmarked within the past year. For those of you who indicated that you're planning to benchmark your desktop support within the next 90 days, six months, or year, uh, I want to encourage you to follow through on those plans because, as I mentioned, benchmarking is, in my opinion, the single best tool to enable an organization to achieve world-class performance, get there efficiently, get there effectively, avoid all the trial and error associated with most incremental improvement. So for those of you that are planning to do it, and it's well over 50% in this poll, uh, I encourage you to follow through on those plans. OK, I'm going to close that poll down, and we're going to move on now with our case study. And what I'm showing here on page 35 is real benchmarking data from a group of nearly 100 desktop support organizations. And I want to give you a cautionary note right up front. And the note is this. Remember what I just said about five minutes ago, scope, scale, complexity, and geography. Those are the things you've got to have right when you select a benchmarking peer group. Otherwise, the comparison is likely to be invalid. The same is true when it comes to this data. Although it's real benchmarking data, you need to be very careful about looking at your own data, comparing it to this, and drawing any conclusions. Whether those conclusions are good, bad, or somewhere in between, chances are they're invalid. Because this peer group needs to be pretty much like your peer group to create a valid comparison. Again, the four dimensions that have to be comparable are scope of service offered by desktop support. The scale, meaning the volume of tickets you handle, has to be pretty close because there is a scale effect in this business. Complexity, how complex is the support you're providing? and geography. You don't want to be comparing, for example, a North American service desk against 
a service desk in Japan or the Philippines or Mexico or someplace like that. The wage rates are very different, and because this is a labor-intensive function, wages really drive the cost, cost per ticket, cost per incident, cost per service request. Okay, that's the disclaimer. When I look at this, the first thing I do is I go to the foundation metrics. The cost metrics don't look good. This desktop support organization had high costs relative to the benchmarking peer group. Second thing I do is I look at customer satisfaction, the most important indicator of quality, and it's relatively low compared to the peer group, 71% versus 81%. Okay, so we've got issues. High costs, low customer satisfaction, and what we're going to do is look at a, cause of, a set of cause-effect diagrams that show how the different key performance indicators interact with each other and impact each other so that we can diagnose why customer satisfaction is low and why cost is high. So let's start with our two foundation metrics, cost per ticket and customer satisfaction. Think of it this way. When you look at a two-dimensional chart with cost on the x-axis, quality on the y-axis, what we get is an array of data points that looks like this. The white data points represent desktop support organizations. The red one is just a theoretical, you know, this might be where your desktop support group is. Now the x-axis is somewhat counterintuitive. As you go to the right, this represents lower cost. You go to the left, that's higher cost. The y-axis is the way it normally is, lower quality on the bottom, higher quality as you move up. And where you want to be on this chart is in the upper right-hand quadrant. This is where you are both efficient and effective, meaning low cost, high quality. That's the holy grail of any support organization, whether you're doing desktop support, service desk, or anything else, delivering support to a user, you want to be low cost, high quality. Again, that's the holy grail. So if you're in this quadrant, what it says is that you have high quality, but your costs are also high. You need to move to the right over time and get your costs down. If you're in this quadrant, you've got low cost, but your quality is not very good, and over time you need to move up, improve your quality. Those that are in the lower left have the worst of everything. They're high cost, low quality, and they need to be taking steps to improve their quality and cut their costs over time so that they can migrate into this upper right-hand quadrant. Now, there is a tension between cost and quality. I alluded to it earlier when I talked about the relationship between cost and customer satisfaction. I've got the same chart shown here. Before benchmarking, typically an organization is not optimized. After benchmarking, it is optimized. And that's why benchmarking is such a powerful tool. It does enable an organization to optimize its performance. So when we think about these foundation metrics, what we want to try and do is reduce our cost and improve our customer satisfaction. But we know we can't impact those directly, so we look at the underlying drivers. Technician utilization is what drives cost per ticket. How do we know? Because the data tells us. And it's common sense. Anytime you get a labor-intensive function, if labor becomes more efficient, then your costs go down. This shows technician utilization, and I will define that for you momentarily. As the number goes up, cost per ticket goes down. Blue data is diamond points, or excuse me, blue diamonds are data points. Red line is a linear regression through the data. Here's how we define utilization in desktop support. You take the number of incidents handled, number of service requests handled, multiply each by the incident work time and the service request work time, and you add that to the travel time. Travel time is significant in this industry. It might be short, it might be five minutes just to go down the hall and provide service. It could be significantly longer. You might have to drive across an army base or a naval base or drive to a different location. Let's say you're providing support for ATMs within a large geographic area. You might have to drive you know, a significant difference to go from one ATM to another and provide service in that way. We divide this by the average number of days worked in a month, which is about 21.5 number of work hours in a day, typically seven and a half, and 60 minutes per hour. So here's an example, page 41, of how you would calculate technician utilization for a typical desktop support organization. I won't go through the math. It's actually quite simple. But I did want to define technician utilization because it does drive your cost per ticket. The more utilized, more highly utilized your techs are, the lower your cost per ticket is going to be. Let's now look at the drivers of customer satisfaction. Tech satisfaction is a significant driver of customer satisfaction. First contact resolution rate for incidents is a significant driver of customer satisfaction, as are your service levels, primarily your mean time to resolve. Now here's a key difference between desktop support and the service desk. In the service desk, service levels don't matter very much. And I'm talking about things like average speed of answer and call abandonment rate. They really don't drive customer satisfaction, but they do drive cost. 
And as you become more aggressive with your service levels, your costs go up, but your customer satisfaction does not. I won't elaborate any further. If you're interested, um, watch our present. You can sign up for our uh, webcast next week, which we're doing jointly with HDI. It's on. Uh, it's called Unleashing the Enormous Power of Service Desk KPIs, and I'll talk about that service level phenomenon at length. But for now, it's important to recognize that service levels do matter on customer satisfaction in a desktop support environment. Here's the data that proves it. Technician satisfaction positively correlated with customer satisfaction. Happy techs equals happy end users. First contact resolution rate positively correlated with customer satisfaction. This is for incidents, not service requests. Incident mean time to resolve in days. As that number goes up, customer satisfaction goes down. There's an inverse correlation there. Now let's look at how training hours impact things like technician job satisfaction, first contact resolution rate, and our service levels. New technician training, as that number goes up, technician satisfaction goes up. There's a positive correlation there. Annual technician training hours, that is after their initial training, also positively correlated with technician job satisfaction. Time on job, the more experienced your techs are, the higher your incident first contact resolution rate will be. That makes sense. Now let's put it all together and look at the build that we have. What we've got are our foundation metrics, somewhat upside down. They're at the very top of our diagram, but they are driven respectively by technician utilization and first contact resolution rate. And then we've got a tertiary set of metrics here that are driving those. The metrics in red are the ones that are on our short list of the most important KPIs. We don't show the balance scorecard on this chart, but it's important to understand this cause and effect diagram because when you understand which metrics drive which other metrics, what are the causal metrics, what are the resulting metrics, these are our foundation metrics, remember, they tell a story. These are the macro measures, but they are driven by causal metrics. When you've got a whole set of, excuse me, they're, they're driven by the underlying drivers, and then you've got a set of causal metrics that drive your work volume. But understanding this cause and effect relationship on the most important KPIs for desktop support gives you a tremendous amount of power because it allows you to pull the levers you need to pull to achieve desired outcomes. You want to improve customer satisfaction, focus on improving your first contact res rate for incidents, reducing your mean times to resolve, and improving customer satisfaction. You want to cut your cost per ticket, look at improving your technician utilization, and also look at whether or not your service levels are too aggressive, because reducing your service levels can improve your technician utilization, which will reduce your cost per ticket. But the countervailing argument is that if you reduce service levels too much, you may impact customer satisfaction. So we're back to our desktop support benchmarking data, and we're now in a position to diagnose why our costs are high and why our customer satisfaction is good. Let's look at our productivity metrics, because productivity is what drives costs. We look at utilization. It's at 46% versus the peer group at 54. Our techs are handling 65 tickets a month versus 81 for the peer group. The ratio of technicians to total headcount is relatively low. It's 73%. For the peer group, it's 84%. So the simple diagnosis here is that you just got too much headcount. That's why your utilization is low. That's why your techs are handling a relatively small number of tickets. Now, the good news, if you want to call it that, is that the turnover for this desktop support group is fairly high. It's 53% a year. The peer group's only at 24%. The good, the upside of turnover, if there is an upside, is that if you need to downsize, if you need to attrit, if you have, if you're you're heavy on headcount, you can attrit fairly quickly and get down to a reasonable headcount, which will improve your utilization and improve all of these productivity metrics and drive your cost down. The short story here is that they did a trade over a relatively short period of time. It only took them about a month to right size their headcount, improve their utilization, and uh, reduce their cost per ticket, incident service requests, bring those into line with the peer group averages, actually below the peer group averages. So the short story was the same as the long story. The diagnosis was straightforward relatively simple remedy, and they got it done in under 90 days. What about our quality metric, customer satisfaction? Why is that number low? Well, remember what drives customer satisfaction. First contact res rate on incidents, technician job satisfaction, and our service levels. Let's look at those. Let's look at first contact resolution rate for incidents, 49%. The peer groups are 55%. Okay, there's one problem. That's one driver of low customer satisfaction. Let's also look at Average incident response time in hours, 9.1 hours to respond to an incident versus 6.3 for the peer group. 
percent of incidents resolved in 24 hours is 33% versus 51% for the peer group. Mean time to resolve an incident, 2.6 days versus 1.9 for the peer group. So the service levels don't look good. That's why the customers are not terribly happy. Weak service levels, weak first contact resolution rate, that results in low customer satisfaction. This diagram explains to us. We never did look at tech satisfaction. Let's check that out and see if that number is uh, also low. Here it is, 71% technician job satisfaction versus 84% for the peer group. So we got a, a bunch of issues going on here. Tech satisfaction is weak, FCR is not good, service levels are not good. All of it results in low customer satisfaction. We know that training hours, and I'm going to elaborate on this in the next section of our best practices model, training hours can improve technician job satisfaction, can also improve your service levels and your first contact resolution rate. If we look at the training hours that these technicians got, new, excuse me, new technician training hours, 10 versus 46 for the peer group, zero annually versus 21 for the peer group. So the short remedy here was you need to make a bit of a, an investment in training. That is going to improve your technician job satisfaction, but more importantly, it's going to improve your first contact resolution rate, and it's going to allow you to start delivering better service levels. So once again, the short story was the same as the long story. The remedy was pretty straightforward. If you understand how the KPIs interconnect, if you understand what the underlying drivers of the foundation metrics are, and if you understand what these tertiary metrics are, sorry, went the wrong way, then you're in a very powerful position to make choices about how you can improve the performance of your organization. With that, I'm going to take a few questions at this point, and I know I won't get to all of the questions, but the questions that I don't get to right now, I will get to at the end of our webcast. I'll stay on as long as necessary to answer any questions that I don't get to right now. Okay, so I've opened up the question dialog box. If you have a question, please type it in. Question from James. Is the MTTR you refer to a desk side only MTTR, or is it end-to-end, -end, i.e. multiple delivery towers? Um, James, it, there are two mean times to resolve. One is for tickets that are handled just by desk side support, and a second one would look at tickets that get resolved in the entire support process. From the customer's perspective, they don't really make a distinction. They think it's all support, and if there's a long MTTR because you know, some other group within the organization, say uh, a NOC or a data center or an apps group, because they were slow to respond, slow to provide a resolution, uh, they tend to blame support. They think of support as being a monolithic whole, that is desktop support, service desk, and all the end levels. So unfortunately, when a service level gets blown or when the MTTR is long because of something outside your control, you still get blamed for it. Uh, you can't necessarily control it. You can raise you know, a, a flag and say, look, we got an issue here, and you know, there's lack of responsiveness at other levels within the organization. You can certainly raise awareness about the lack of responsiveness at other levels, but you don't have direct control over it. So MTTR, the way I presented it uh, in this webcast, refers to MTTR that the, for the tickets that desktop support has control over, because that really is how you can influence your outcomes. Oftentimes, those tickets that get resolved outside your organization, you have limited influence over. Okay, from Richard, did you say Spock was single point of contact? Yes, I did. Um, okay, uh, from James, how do you determine cost per incident, cost per service request? If it's just the fully loaded cost of the tech divided by the number of tickets, won't your cost go down if you increase the number of tickets? Um, it's not just uh, the cost of a tech divided by the number of tickets. It also includes uh, the indirect cost, which uh, indirect labor cost, which is your supervisors, your team leads, your workforce schedulers, your trainers, your QA, QC people. It includes your facilities, that is the space that you occupy. It includes your travel, your training, your telecommunications cost, your technology cost. It includes everything. But because it's a labor-intensive environment, generally about two-thirds of your costs are tied up uh, in your personnel. Half that cost is agent cost, and then another 15, 16 percent is your indirect headcount, like I mentioned, supervisors, team leads, and so on. Now, your question, so, so that's one part of the answer to your question. Is it fully loaded cost of the tech? No, it includes everything divided by the number of tickets. And then you say, won't your cost go down if you increase uh, the number of tickets? Um, yes, if you can increase the number of tickets but maintain your headcount, of course your cost per ticket would go down. So I, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question fully, uh, but the, the short answer is, Yes, if, uh, if your headcount stays constant, the number of tickets goes up, 
uh, you will see your cost per contact go down. If you're referring to the case study we just went through, um, uh, since the desktop support group did a trit over time, they had a lower head count, same ticket volume, their cost per ticket went down because their labor costs were lower. Um, okay, a question from Jeff. Uh, what is exactly a desktop support benchmark? Uh, where do we start? Um, that's something we should probably take offline, Jeff. Um, I can answer that question a little bit more thoroughly for you um, after the webcast. Um, uh, ben benchmarking is a smart thing to do, and I hope you do pursue that. Um, but uh, it is something that uh, if anybody has that same question or comparable question, I would encourage you to follow up with MetricNet afterwards. In fact, we are going to be reaching out to everybody who was on this webcast, sending you an email following the webcast, and inviting you to participate in a brief 20-minute consultation session with MetricNet free of charge. We'll answer your questions about desktop support. Um, we'll answer your questions about benchmarking, how you get started on benchmarking, how we can assist you with that. So, um, Jeff, we'll be reaching out to you. If you want to be proactive and reach out to us, just send us a, a quick email at info at metricnet.com. From Reyes, um, uh, let's see, I have to join a meeting but would like to take the survey. Okay, when you exit the webcast, GoToWebinar should automatically present the survey to you. Hopefully that will happen to anybody as you, to all of you as you leave the webcast. Um, okay, from David. Should cost and quality be metrics on the same measure of importance as timing and customer satisfaction? Um, David, it's a judgment call on the balanced scorecard. Uh, and it's really up to each individual what weight they put on the different metrics in their scorecard. Uh, the, the weightings that we had represent our you know, collective judgment, having done this for a while, and uh, which metrics we think are more important than others. We think cost is pretty important. We think customer satisfaction is pretty important. But you know, whatever your judgment tells you in terms of how you weight the metrics in the scorecard, that, that's fine. It doesn't have, you don't have to follow the same weights that we put in the scorecard. The bigger point I was trying to make is that if you don't have a scorecard, you should create one because it's fairly straightforward and it gives you a lot of extremely valuable information. Okay, uh, from Amber, how do you calculate technician satisfaction? Uh, you survey them once or twice a year, Amber. Short survey take, usually takes less than 15 minutes to complete, usually five or fewer questions. You ask them about training. You ask them about coaching. You ask them about, um, uh, and, and of course, the most important question is, overall, how would you rate your satisfaction with your position here? Scale of one to five, typically, is what we recommend. Uh, it doesn't have to be terribly complicated. Um, it's, uh, you know, there are tools like SurveyMonkey and others that enable you to set something like this up fairly quickly and get a real quick read on the, on the uh, um, agent satisfaction or the technician job satisfaction, but I would encourage you to pursue that. Uh, again, keep, keep the, the uh, survey short. Um, put it on a scale of one to five. Uh, there are many online tools that enable you to do something like this very quickly at, at very low cost, but it is definitely worth doing. We recommend surveying uh, technicians, uh, their job satisfaction, at least once a year, if not twice a year. Um, okay, from Todd. As technician utilization becomes too high, customer satisfaction goes down. Um, something about not enough quality cycles uh, per incident. Yes, uh, Todd, you're right. In extreme cases, if the technician utilization gets too high, what you have is a situation where the technicians are spread too thin. And then uh, what you get is a backlog of tickets, and your mean times to resolve start to suffer, and customers become dissatisfied. Oftentimes, the technicians will speed up their work and get a little bit sloppy. So it's true that, to a certain extent, higher technician utilization is better but generally at around 60%, using the definition that we provided earlier, if you get much above 60%, you start to see a drop off in uh, customer satisfaction. If you see much above 60% technician utilization, you start to see a drop off in uh, customer satisfaction. Okay. From Doug, we use a Spock model, but also offer customer self-service for ticket creation. Is this an effective alternative in addressing the drive-by mentality? Uh, it can be, Doug, but only if um, the desktop support technicians continue to enforce the SPOC model, meaning that if they are grabbed for a drive-by, a fly-by, a snag, um, they have to, you know, let the customer, the you know, the person requesting service know that, look, there's a self-service portal, you can try that, or you can call level one, and if they can't resolve it quickly, you know, they will dispatch a desktop support technician. So it's still incumbent upon desktop support to exercise some discipline over the and user population to make sure that they, in fact, are following uh, a Spock model. Okay, um, I've answered all the questions that were in the queue. If you have other questions, 
please type them in the dialog box in the lower right. And at the conclusion of the webcast, I'm going to answer all of the remaining questions. These final two sections of the best practices model go pretty quickly, so I realize it's already 3.15. I, I should be done by 3.30. The third section of our model has to do with human resource management. Uh, and this is all about managing the human resources over the life cycle. What I've got on page 54 is a diagram that shows some of the more common best practices when it comes to human resource management for desktop support. This is not a complete list, but these are some of the more common industry best practices. I've got a shorthand uh, definition for the best practice in the left column. I elaborate it on a, a little bit in the second column from the left. Then in the upper right-hand corner, I list some key performance indicators. I've got turnover, mean time to resolve, uh, resolution at level one, first contact resolution rate for incidents, utilization, customer satisfaction, cost per ticket. And here's how you interpret this diagram. At the intersection of these KPIs and these best practices, you have these cells. They're either white, light blue, or dark blue. A dark blue cell indicates that there is a strong cause and effect relationship between the key performance indicator and the best practice. So what this says is that if I do a benchmark and I find my turnover is high, remember we just went through a case study and we found that this organization had high turnover. Let me get back to that. Their technician turnover was 53% per year. That's high. One possibility might be that they're recruiting the wrong people. They're finding individuals that, well, maybe they're not cut out to do this job. I mean, you're basically doing 911 work all day long. Some people can do it and do it well. Other people don't really like the day in, day out pressure, ticket after ticket after ticket. So recruiting can go a long ways towards ensuring that you get the right people in the organization and reducing turnover. So a dark blue cell indicates a strong cause-effect relationship between the KPI and the best practice. A light blue cell indicates that there is a weak cause-effect relationship between the KPI and the best practice. And a white cell indicates little or no cause-effect relationship between the key performance indicator and the best practice. So this page is a little bit of a cheat sheet. If you do a benchmark and say, yeah, our costs are high, customer satisfaction is low, utilization is not good, and so on, what you can do is look at this, and this at least tells you, OK, when it comes to human resource management, these are some of the levers I might be able to pull to improve my first contact resolution rate. Well, no surprise that training has something to do with that. Uh, what if I want to improve my MTTR? Well, training is one way you can do that. And just putting in place a performance standard. Let's say your mean time to resolve on incidents is two days. Oftentimes, just creating a standard that says, well, our new standard is one day can go a long ways towards improving your performance. It's uh, surprising how often we find that when our clients put in place a performance goal or a standard, their performance automatically improves just because they've got that performance goal there. So this chart is designed to help you understand the relationship between key performance indicators and some of the more common best practices when it comes to human resource management in the desktop environment. Now the scorecard that I introduced earlier was a scorecard for all of desktop support. But increasingly what we have found is that our clients are implementing scorecards for each individual technician that works in desktop support. Mechanically, these scorecards work exactly the same as the scorecard I went through earlier. In this particular scorecard, we also have eight metrics customer satisfaction. So this assumes that you can measure customer satisfaction by ticket and tie it back to an individual technician. You look at first contact resolution rate on incidents. Again, this assumes you can tie that back to individual technicians. How many incidents did they close in the month? That's a productivity measure. How many service requests did they close? Another productivity measure. How much unplanned absenteeism is there? Even soft metrics like teamwork and initiative and mentoring can be included in your scorecard. Just put them on a scale like 1 to 5, as I've done here. You can range from 0 says you're not doing any mentoring, you don't take any initiative, uh, your teamwork is not very good, all the way up to the other extreme, which says you're, you're the ultimate team player, you take initiative on everything, and you mentor a lot of people. You're doing a great job with all that stuff. So even a soft metric like these, you can put a, a numerical scale on it and calculate every month for every technician that works in desktop support what their score is. The value of this is that it objectifies the process of delivering feedback to your technicians. Too often what I find is that whether the feedback is given weekly, monthly, semi-annually, annually, it doesn't matter, the feedback is too often subjective. Hey, you did a pretty good job, but we think you could have probably taken a, a little bit more initiative. You probably, your FCR wasn't as good as it could have been, and 
okay, so I'm going to give you a 1% raise this year and, um, you know, what, whatever it might be. So often, that's the kind of feedback session that we find in support, desktop support as well as level one service desk support. The value of a scorecard is that you are driving objective feedback using the quantifiable performance of the technicians that work uh, in this environment. Now, I'll be the first to admit that not every technician is going to be comfortable with this, and not every desktop support organization is going to be comfortable with this. But there's a remarkable correlation between organizations that have adopted this and organizations that are high performance. There's also a remarkable correlation between technicians that perform well and technicians that like having this sort of objective feedback. Now, many of our clients go even further, and this gets even more controversial, I'll admit that. They'll go even further and they will rank each technician on a monthly basis and say, okay, technician number 18, you don't publish the names, you don't want to deliberately embarrass anybody. Technician number 18 scored 32.6 on the balance scorecard. Technician number 11 scored 95.8 on the balance scorecard. If I'm technician number 27, I see that I rank 17th for the month, but I've improved quite a bit because my six-month trailing average is 27.6%. This month I was 43.7%, so I'm slowly moving my way up the ranks. Again, I realize this is controversial. Not every organization is comfortable with this, but the value is incredible. And those organizations that have adopted this, they drive higher quality feedback, better feedback. It's clearer to the technicians what they need to do to improve their performance. And it leaves no doubt in anybody's mind about how every individual technician is performing within the organization. I mentioned earlier that I was going to comment on the key drivers of technician job satisfaction. And that's what I've done here. The three big drivers are this, frequent high quality coaching, having a formal and documented career path, and adequate training. These are the three big drivers of technician job satisfaction. Now, many of you who work in this environment know that it's a challenge to maintain morale in a support environment. It's even more difficult in level one uh, than it is in desktop support. But job satisfaction and morale are proxies for each other. The higher the technician job satisfaction goes, the better the morale in the organization is. The better the morale, the higher performing the organization will be. You get better customer satisfaction, you get lower absenteeism and turnover, which leads to lower cost per contact. So the technician job satisfaction doesn't just happen. People are under the impression that, ah, oh, the morale's not very good, what can I do? Or morale's really good, that's great, I'm not sure why, but you know, morale is great. You do have control over this. And the levers that you can pull to drive job satisfaction are the three that I've shown here. Frequent quality coaching, having a formal documented career path, and providing adequate training opportunities, not just initial training, but ongoing annual training. These are the big drivers of technician job satisfaction. Let's turn our attention now to the final component of our best practices model. Mar we call it marketing, but it's really about actively managing stakeholder perceptions and expectations. I'm going to introduce a chart here. <clears throat> And what this chart shows on the x-axis is the value that an organization creates. And we know there are at least a few different ways we can measure value. I quantified those in our first section on support strategy. So we look at value on the x-axis, high value on the right, low value on the left. And then we look at the perception of value on the y-axis. In other words, what, is the, what do the stakeholders think? Do they think you're you know, not doing a very good job or do they think you're doing a great job? Well, the only line on this chart that really makes any sense is the diagonal, because the diagonal represents where actual value and perceived value are the same thing. If you're not doing a very good job, and the perception is that you're not doing a very good job, well, at least the perception is fair. You're not doing a good job. If you're doing a great job, and the perception is that you're doing a great job, good. The perception is fair. But too often what happens is that desktop support organizations operate down here in the red zone. I've painted this red for a reason. Red is bad, red is danger, green is good. This is a very common position for an organization, meaning that they tend to deliver good value, but they're not recognized for it. In other words, the perception is less than the actual value. The perceived value is less than the actual value. Anything under this diagonal line is where the perception is less than the reality. Anything above the, the diagonal line is where the perceived value is greater than the actual value, which, by the way, never happens. I've never seen it in my career, anyway. 
what does frequently happen is this. Desktop support operates in a position where they may be delivering good value, but they're not given credit for it. They're not recognized for it. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to close the gap between perception and reality? We call it the perception gap. Because if you're operating here, you're living on borrowed time. Decisions are not based on reality. They're based on perception. And if the perception is that you're not doing a very good job, decisions will be made accordingly. That might be a decision not to fund you properly. It might be a decision to deny you a particular project or piece of technology or headcount. But oftentimes, decisions that are based on a perception which is inaccurate are bad decisions. So these decisions that get made that impact desktop support, if they're not based upon reality, they could end up being bad decisions. And that's why it's so important to close the perception gap and make sure that the perceived value and the actual value are one and the same. We want perception and reality to be the same so that good decisions are made about desktop support. So MetricNet delivers a full-day workshop on image management. I'm going to give you the five-minute version right here. There's five W's that make up this model. Who are the key stakeholder groups? You've got to identify those. What are the messages that you want to communicate to those stakeholder groups? And by the way, this model, this five-part model, applies as well to the service desk. For those of you that were on our service desk best practices webinar last month, you're familiar with this. You've seen it already. It is as important for desktop support to manage their image as it is for the level one service desk to manage its, its image. Moreover, it is as important to manage your image as it is to deliver high quality service. It's amazing how many support groups ignore this altogether. I would say more than 80% of IT support groups, whether at level one or desktop support, completely ignore this piece of managing their image. The result is that they may be delivering great value, but there's a huge perception gap on what they're actually doing. So you may have seen this if you were on our webinar last month. Second part of our model, what are the messages you want to communicate? Number three, when do you communicate? How often? How frequently? Where do you reach the stakeholders? How do you reach them? And then there's an interesting punchline here. Why do you even want to do all this? OK, I'm going to boil it down for you. As I mentioned, we do a full day workshop on this, but I'm giving you the five-minute version. Let's talk about timing. The key thing to remember here is frequent contact. At new employee orientation, they should be made aware of their support resources, level one and desktop support resources. When they log in to the company's network, they should be reminded or there should be an icon there that lets them know that support is nearby. Click this to chat, click this to talk, that sort of thing. When there are IT training sessions, these don't have to be support training, I'm just talking about IT training in general, the end user should be made aware of their support options. During an incident or service request or a ticket, you can communicate, let them know what's going on because absent any information to the contrary, oftentimes your customers will have unrealistic expectations about how quickly their ticket will be resolved. And even if you break every record in the book in resolving their ticket, and they thought you were going to do it sooner, you're not going to get credit for that. So you got to communicate to them. Let them know what the expected wait time, when the expected resolution is going to happen. And at scheduled sessions. Increasingly, our clients, support organizations worldwide, do webcasts just like this one, short webcasts over lunch. Anybody who wants to listen in on what the service desk or desktop support are doing, learn about the services, major initiatives, their performance levels, some frequently asked questions and success stories, They'll schedule a monthly webinars. In some cases, they do it weekly. What are the messages? Well, I just outlined those. The more you communicate with your stakeholders, the better. And how do you communicate with them? Well, use every channel at your disposal. Newsletters, reference guides that are online, surveys of your customers, login messages, and then user liaisons. What are these? Well, these are individuals that are designated within departments or groups within your company. For example, you'll have a user liaison in the sales department in the human resources department, in accounting, and so on. And their job is to act as the eyes and the ears of desktop support, or all of support, for support, and to provide feedback for support. And also to communicate messages back to those end users in human resources, or finance, or accounting, and so on. These user liaisons are invaluable. They can provide an important channel of communication between desktop support and the service desk and your end users throughout the enterprise. Now, as I mentioned, there's an interesting punchline here. Why are we doing this? We've heard the expression that expectations not set are expectations not met, which is very true. So we need to be serious about proactively managing expectations. 
More than 10 years ago, I had a client send this comic to me. And it reads, delight customers, why can't we just satisfy them like we used to? The reason is that satisfied customers are not loyal customers. They don't propagate positive word of mouth referrals. And if your customers are merely satisfied, you're going to have a big perception gap. We don't want that. So what we need are delighted customers because they're the customers that are loyal. They're the customers that propagate positive word of mouth referrals. They're the ones that indicate that we're creating real value at this interface. Here's why it matters. Because the reputation of all of IT, the customer satisfaction for all of IT depends upon the quality of service that you deliver at desktop support and at the service desk. The vast majority of end user opinion about all of IT is generated at these interfaces. This is why it's so important not just to deliver a high quality of service, but to make sure that your stakeholders understand the quality of service that you're delivering. Close that gap between perception and reality. Fairly straightforward. I've said this on a few different occasions today. It doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't cost a lot of money, but it is critically important. Your success in support depends as much on your image as it does on your actual performance. This is something a lot of people don't understand, is that image management really matters. It's not a luxury. It's not a nice to have. It is a true necessity if you want to manage this function properly. The benefits of effective in image management include loyalty, positive word of mouth referrals, credibility, which allows you to get things done. The more credibility you've got, the more you can get done in your organization. It drives a positive image for all of IT, and it creates high levels of customer satisfaction. So let me sum it all up for you. We've gone through a four-part model today. We've looked at strategy, performance measurement, human resources, and marketing. Think strategically, which means preventive and proactive. Recognize that you're part of an end-to-end -end support process and recognize that getting it done at level one is the best way to minimize total cost of ownership. If you understand that cost hierarchy, level one is the lowest cost of support, followed by desktop support, level three IT, field support, vendor support. Getting it done as low as you can on that pyramid helps to minimize total cost of ownership. So emphasize level one resolutions, even if it means pushing tickets back on level one. If you're in desktop support, you're getting tickets that could and should have been resolved at level one, think about pushing those back, assuming that they have the capacity to handle those at level one. And recognize how value is created. I outlined uh, the, the, uh, one of the primary economic contributions of a top performing support organization is that you make the end users more productive. Secondly, when it comes to performance measurement, less is more. Small number of key performance indicators. Make sure you've got a balanced scorecard. You should be benchmarking at least once a year. And if you understand the cause-effect relationships between the most important key performance indicators, that puts you in a very powerful position to pull the levers you need to pull to achieve desired outcomes. Take a holistic view of human resource management. Invest in training and development because that drives technician job satisfaction, which in turn drives customer satisfaction. Technicians also like to see a career path they want frequent and effective coaching. And what we've found is that they actually want individual accountability. That's why I brought up the whole issue of the technician scorecard. When it comes to managing your message, recognize that perception and reality are not the same thing. You need to close any gap that exists between those two. Desktop support is a key driver of IT perceptions, not just the perception of support, but the perception of all of IT. And you need to be prepared to communicate the value that you contribute to the organization economically and otherwise. The bottom line on desktop support is this. It's now being managed as a much more strategic asset within the enterprise, one that can reduce the overall cost of IT by minimizing TCO for support, dramatically improve the productivity of end users. Remember the difference between a first quartile and a fourth quartile support organization is 30 productive hours per employee per year. Huge and drive a positive view of IT. These are the three sources of leverage we covered. A strategic desktop support organization is going to have the following. You're going to be part of an end-to-end -end support process. You're going to understand TCO and the importance of first contact and first level resolution rate. You're going to use performance metrics diagnostically. You're not just going to track performance and put pretty graphs on the wall. You're looking at KPIs in an effort to understand what's going on so that you can make intelligent decisions about how to manage the organization. 
You invest in technician training, coaching, and career pathing. You have active efforts to manage your image, internal marketing, and you aggressively promote and communicate the value delivered by desktop support. Now going forward, there's a few things that you can do. You can register for our future webcasts. We just posted uh, our next uh, 12 webcasts for the next 12 months. You can go to our website, metricnet.com, and sign up for the next webcast. That we'll, we've got one next week on KPIs. We've got one next month on desktop. Next, next week's is on desk, excuse me, service desk KPIs. Our webcast next month in November is on desktop support KPIs. You can also download our white papers. Those are always free. Again, you can get those at metricnet.com. And within the next 24 hours, each of you will be receiving an email from MetricNet offering a brief session, 20 minutes. We'd like to introduce ourselves. We'd like to get to know you. And we want to give you a chance to ask us any questions you might have, either about your desktop support organization or uh, about today's presentation. Finally, uh, for those who are serious about becoming world class and want to get there quickly, our desktop support benchmark is probably the quickest and easiest way to get there. This benchmark is built on MetricNet's worldwide database of desktop support process and performance indicators, and it's the most comprehensive benchmark in the industry. It includes benchmarks of more than 30 key performance indicators. It includes a balanced scorecard, and it includes a roadmap to achieve world-class performance that is very specific and unique to your desktop support organization. Now, a desktop support benchmark is just one of the ways that we can assist you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, we also do benchmarking for service desks, call centers, and field service organizations. Now, for those of you that would like to reach MetricNet, our number in the United States is shown here, 703-992-7559. And I'll get to questions momentarily. You can email us at info at metricnet.com, or you can always reach us through our website at metricnet.com. Now, for those who have time to stay on for a few more minutes, I will be answering any questions that you typed in during the webcast. And for those who must exit the webcast at this time, I just want to say thank you for attending the session. I do hope you found it to be informative and insightful. Please remember to complete the brief survey that pops up when you exit the webcast. This is a requirement if you wish to receive a copy of today's presentation. So thank you once again. And uh, let me get to the uh, questions in the queue here. If you have a question, please type it in. Um, question from Rich, can we get a copy of the slide deck? The short answer is yes. All you have to do is answer the questionnaire that pops up when you exit uh, the webcast. Okay. Uh, from Todd, less a question than a request for verification. As tech utilization becomes too high, oh, I think I already answered that question, sorry. Um, okay, from Sean. Uh, what is the average resolved incidence for a traveling field support engineer and an on-site field support? Um, I addressed that indirectly very early on in the webcast when I told you that the number of technicians uh, per user uh, or even per ticket varies dramatically from organization to organization, driven by a lot of factors, including, including the user population density, including the, the age of the devices, the refresh rate of the devices, the mix of devices, the number of devices the average user has. So when you ask about the average resolved incidents for traveling field support engineer, it's hard to answer the question. The number is as low as 25 per month and as high as 100 per month um, in, in terms of an on-site field support. And really on-site, we would call that desktop, not field support, but on-site. Uh, you know, we've seen as few as um, you know, 40 or 50 tickets per month and as many as uh, 200 tickets per month. So the, any average that I give you, Sean, is going to be misleading. Um, you have to calculate the utilization using the formula that I told you about. Get that number up between 50 and 60 percent. That's when you know that your field techs and your desktop support techs are being well utilized. Uh, what you don't want to do is say, well, the industry average is 25 tickets per tech per month or 100 tickets per tech per month, so we think our techs ought to do that. No, your environment is unique, and the number of techs you need for your tickets and your environment is going to be different than anyone else in the industry. Okay, from Doug, we use a Spock model, but also offer customer self-service. I, I actually answered that question earlier. I apologize. Okay, uh, let's see. From Pat, uh, 
like the presentation. Okay, thank you, Pat. I'm glad to hear that. If there are any other questions, please type them in now. We've got a question here from Anthony. What factors do you look at to calculate the cost per ticket and technician utilization? I answered that question um, about a half hour ago. Um, we look at uh, the technician salaries and benefits. We look at contractor salaries and benefits. We look at salaries and benefits of indirect personnel, including supervisors, team leads, workforce schedulers, QAQC people, and trainers. We also look at the facilities cost, meaning the cost for your space. Even if you own the building, you still have a facilities cost associated with that. We look at telecom cost. We look at travel, training, office supplies. It's a fully loaded cost, and then we divide that by the ticket volume. Moreover, we organize those by incident and service requests. So it's, it's usually not good enough to just know your cost per ticket. It's important to understand cost per incident, cost per service request. Generally, cost per service request is higher than cost per incident because service requests typically take longer to resolve than incidents do. It's not always the case, but generally, a cost per service request will be higher than your cost uh, per incident. But it is important to uh, break those down. OK, if there are any other questions, please type them in. Otherwise, I'll be concluding here in the next uh, few seconds. Once again, I want to thank everybody who joined us today. We had a great group from a lot of different countries worldwide. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in. Otherwise, uh, don't forget to uh, complete the survey that pops up when you exit the webcast. Once again, if you want to get a copy of today's presentation, you need to uh, complete the survey. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody once again uh, for attending. Thank you. Goodbye now.